Hello, this is the Convergence Forum of the International Intercommunalist Convergence. And we are truly international, actually. You know, we're connected now with Red Wasp here in Belgium. And we uh, are now uh, also connected with uh, Lebanon, Italy, and uh, France who are new additions, you know, to our convergence. And I am uh, Dr. Ibrahim uh, Weisfeld, uh, PhD in political science from the Université de Québec Montréal. And uh, we're here in the pursuit of um, rationality and in international relations. International relations, geopolitical relations, as it's called, is just um, a mindless, competitive striving for imperial design so far. And yet, we have something new, BRICS, which is now to include Iran, <laughs> even, you know. And the United States is freaking out, you know, they're objecting, they're saying they shouldn't be in there, you know, like <laughs> telling, you know, like speaking to uh, these other countries like Iran, as if they were the father telling their children, you know, what to do. <laughs> it's incredible. And yet BRICS continues on, and now they even have their own monetary notes uh which i saw put put in holding one 100 uh credit notes uh which have a circle on them you know being a logo for bricks mm -hmm. so you know the the money's printed already you know they're all ready to go you know they're moving very quickly i find i'm very impressed they they have been um bricks has been organizing um among each other for several years now. Um, and especially what, what what has changed over the last years or even over the last months is the relationship between, or the relation between um, Iran and uh, Russia, which are just two neighbors. They, they have the Caspian Sea um, between mm -hmm. them. And they are, right, they, they are now going into bilateral, many bilateral agreements um, on trade, on uh, security and so on for which they no longer need Europe, for which they certainly yeah. no longer need the United States. Yeah. And I think that the United States will have to get used that their time of being the, the, the only superpower, the only hegemon, that's, that's finished. They had like 30 years of that, but um, there are um, new powers coming on, China, Russia. Um, I'm not really sure what I will do, because India is like... Uh, as we say in Dutch, with it, uh, over the horse, with the one leg on one side and one leg on the other side. Mm. Um, Modi and the Hindutva fascists really support the Zionist state, really hope to get as much attention from uh, the Americans uh, as possible. But on the other hand, a whole part of the Indian bourgeoisie wants to get through uh, the, 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 this neocon relation with uh, the UK and uh, the United States, and they want to become really, really independent. So it's not really sure what will happen there, but Russia, um, China, Iran, um, they are all going a very independent course. And yes, I'm very United interested States in seeing slow... there, there's a pact, uh, there's a, a peace treaty now between India and uh, China, whereas previously they had mm -hmm. some uh, military disputes over, t over border regions there, but they've resolved that. And... Russia has now a military pact of self-defense, mutual self-defense with North Korea. And Russia has these uh, relations now with Iran and Iran has relations with everyone in BRICS now. These are, you know, just in one week, you know, these are three developments, you know, which are accelerating. The development of uh, of uh, BRICS, BRICS, what is BRICS? BRICS is uh, the third world so-called, uh, but which is now the... Uh, Developing nations, you know, have formed an, a, a brilliant alliance, you know, to contest uh, imperial hegemony. And they're succeeding. It's very impressive. Mm -hmm. And and uh, very fast, accelerating. Accelerating in its development as well, which is an interesting feature of this. BRICS started off very slow in order to maintain its stability and to achieve stability. And now it's accelerating because it has achieved what its subjective initial objective was. And now how many how many affiliates does it have now? Like 19 or something like that? Incredible. 
but there's also the fact that and, and that's the dialectics of history um it's because of the the extreme aggression of uh the american led imperialist uh world that mm. the brics countries were actually forced closer and closer together mm. um and having this um same opponent um actually had to make them sharper and uh and they found things that are if you think about it just common sense countries that are close together should work together and uh, mm. um as i said russia and iran they don't need europe uh to to go into agreements russia and china they don't need uh somebody else to be in between so we are slowly going towards a new world order how it will be like i don't know but i think that the old powers the the, the europe american led imperialist world order is finished it's um hmm. it will try to to defend what it still has and probably it will become even more brutal with even more attempts at wars but um they're no longer capable of really uh, uh, uh in the wars that they waged like 20 years ago. Mm. Uh, let's consider what this new formation BRICS is. Besides being a name, in terms of constitutional theory, it seems to me that what they're forming is a confederation. They're forming an international unity which has a political dimension to it and a political economy embedded in it as well, insofar as they're developing a new... Uh, a new uh, currency. So uh, this goes beyond merely, you know, interstate alliances, you know, and treaties and all that sort of bullshit. This is a new political formation that goes beyond the nation state. They have achieved a level of political maturity and sophistication that rejects the nation state as a fundamental aspect of, uh, of governance. Now we have something which is um, dealing with uh, the imperial designs on the uh, previous, you know, third world. And they have broken out of this schema and they have developed something which is not only a defense against imperial design, but it is also a break from the European nation state concept as well, which is fundamental to the United Nations still, but they nonetheless have uh, gone beyond this uh, nation-state concept in which each nation-state is in competition with every other nation-state. Uh-uh. No longer is this the case. Now they're cooperating. In spite of capitalism, in spite of the competitive nature of each of their national bourgeoisies, they're going beyond the will, desires, and interests of their given national bourgeoisie and their nation-state. Nation-state, in fact, has been uh, uh, dépassé in French, we say. Uh, has been overcome. And uh, so it is not only a, uh, an alliance which overcomes imperialism. This is an alliance which overcomes, you know, the previous, you know, dictates of the nation status developed by Europe, which are still, you know, the organizational features of all the countries, you know, in the world today. And there's 194 of them in the United Nations, in spite of the fact that there are, of course, you know, 3,000 nations in the world in terms of... Uh, a sociological definition, or in terms of um, self-definition. So, you know, like something is happening here which is historic in nature, and one cannot predict what is going to be happening to the United Nations, because it is surely mm -hmm. going to be outdated. It's going to be overcome. And uh, such initiatives are being undertaken, you know, in the United Nations General Assembly now, because the Security Council is considered to be in contradiction to the will of the uh, General Assembly, right? So, you know, like, first of all, there's no Africa in the General Security Council. Why? Because, you know, Africa previously was debased, uh, uh, you know, the territory divided amongst the various imperial powers, and that's ended. So where is Africa going to be in the, uh, in the Security Council? Is it going to be the African Union? Or are they going to choose, you know, some uh, major capitalist power amongst the African nation states and, and place it? in the Security Council as a as a token of uh, expression for the uh, for Africa. You know, what are they going to do? Nigeria. They're probably going to choose Nigeria because it is the most corrupt and most capitalist of the African nation states. So are they going to say that Nigeria should come into the Security Council in place of the African Union? 
is the African Union ready to assume its uh, political voice on behalf of Africa as a continent or uh, south of Sahara, you know, African national uh, entity in the Security Council? You know, who knows what's going to be happening? It's very complicated because the nation state constitutional uh, stratagem, you know, itself obscures, you know, defeats, you know, the unity of the uh, African continent. So how are they going to get into the Security Council? You know, that's not um, settled yet. Then the role of the Security Council itself, can it be overridden by a two-thirds supermajority of the General Assembly? Supposedly it can, you know, because there is an article to that effect in the Constitution of the United Nations, which allow for the General Assembly to overrule the Security Council, but it's never been done. Now is the time to do so. If the uh, Security Council does not send uh, peacekeeping troops into Gaza to stop the genocide of the Palestinian people and to open up the crossing points for international aid, if the Security Council is not willing to do so, the General Assembly must overrule the Security Council and authorize and legitimatize the sending of uh, peacekeeping troops into Gaza to stop the Zionist military from its occupation and its uh, and its uh, starvation of the Palestinian people, in particular, the 200,000 or 300,000 that remain in North Gaza who are now being starved to death. So can the United Nations and the General Assembly overcome this impasse? I don't know. And it's urgent and imminent. This is a decision that must be made now. So can the BRICS uh, Federation of nation states and their power move into the United Nations and take it over as they should. Okay, so they develop a political economy. They have their own currency, yes. They have their own uh, military defense packs, yes. But what is needed and what is urgent is them to move into the United Nations and to take it over away from the hands of the United States of America. Otherwise, Gaza will be lost. You know, just like my family was lost in the Holocaust. You know, I can foresee that Gaza will be lost. They will be killed. They will be starved to death in the hundreds of thousands. That's what's being planned by the Zionist occupation of, of Gaza. And then they would move on to the West Bank to do the same. Because, you know, the Palestinians cannot find anywhere else to go. And uh, nowhere else will there, or will there be a nation state that supports the expulsion of the Palestinians, you know, from Palestine. So this is certainly a historic, you know, uh, point of uh, transition into something, either fascism or socialism. As Rosa Luxemburg said, it's either socialism or barbarism. And we're facing that moment now, as the moment was faced in the First World War and in the face of Nazism. Now we have a third such uh, historical point, and I'm not, I'm not sure what's going to be happening. I mean, I can I wish, see... you know, but wishes, you know, is just, you know, like idealism. It's not, you know, what is to be. What do you think? Please help. We will already see, like in the last year, um, several countries from the global south for the first time, they really played an active role in the United Nations and they really um, stood firm uh, in their condemnation of the Zionist state. Um, you have the procedure um, the, the, uh, uh, for genocide that uh, South Africa has started uh, for the uh, uh, with the ICJ and so on. So I do see that there is an evolution there. Um, the United Nations started out as um, an organization of all the imperialist countries. Um, I don't think there was any member states from uh, Africa then. Um, um, right now, this is turning. And I think that, that BRICS, um, BRICS is also empowering the non-BRICS countries from the global south. Um, right now, I think that internationally, um, geopolitically for the first time several 
people start seeing that there uh, there is a valuable alternative. Um, and for a very long time, um, from the 1980s on, but especially after the fall of the Soviet Union and the socialist regimes in um, Eastern Europe, um, the there is no alternative ideology was just very strong. Everybody believed that uh, um, capitalism, like Fukuyama said, it was the end of history. Um, capitalism had won. We were finally living in the, the, the liberal mm. democracy and mm. um but history is happening once again, and things are changing quite quickly. Mm. Um, I, I saw an interview with Professor Marandi yesterday, um, the professor uh, um, from Iran, uh, um, uh, politicologist, um, where he where he actually pointed out that uh, um, right now, under American pressure, um, there's a unity forming um that that is actually solving problems that have existed for a very long time uh, and not just political but logistic problems for the region there and um russia iran india china um they have all been pushed together um there were uh, in the last few months there were many bilateral um negotiations um especially china with other countries but also um other countries uh, among them and there is really a unity growing and it's a different unity than what we have here in Europe because of course here in Europe we also have this um, European Union that is supposedly transcends the nation state but it's actually the three four strongest nation states of Europe that uh, have found a way to semi-colonize um, uh, mm -hmm. southern Europe and now eastern and central Europe and so um, BRICS is nothing like that BRICS is uh, really it's it's not ideal and they're not saints they they, they are real governments um, with real interests and of course they're protecting those interests they're protecting the interests of their ruling class as well but the the, the interests of the russian ruling class of the the, the, the indian ruling class um of the, it's, it's quite complicated in china because um there is a capitalist class but you shouldn't say it because nobody should really say it because it's still a socialist country um and actually, this uh, capitalist class has a very strong um, part of the, the the communist party behind them, but mm -hmm. there's also a very strong revolutionary proletarian part of the the, the same party. And <laughs> out, outwardly, the, there's there one block. There's complete unity, but everybody mm -hmm. who really knows the situation tells that there are five, six, seven different factions, which all have a different program. Um, but even there, the, the Chinese uh, billionaire capitalist class, um, they all realized that right now the main contradictions um, are between them and the American imperialism that is going for a new trade war, that is is, is trying to desperately save uh, the, their, the, their position that they had as the economic and political hegemon of this world, which which they, they have lost. Um, the, 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 the American era is over. Um, we don't notice it yet, but you, you can if if you look at the the American presidential elections have become uh, 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 some kind of big Hollywood uh, comedy farce. There's there's nothing serious anymore, and there are more and more critical people, especially in the younger generation, they understand that going to vote for uh, this clown or the other clown. I mean, they're two puppets, and it, it's the capitalist class that that holds them, and then so. People are seeing through this, and um, I think that the, the system will collapse in, uh, in the United States. Probably here in Europe, in many countries, the system will also collapse. And as BRICS is, will be gaining momentum and more and more countries in the global south will try to go a more independent course, um, this means that our over-exploitation of the third world will come to an end. But if there's no longer this over-exploitation of our semi-colonies, um, there are far less uh, uh, means, there are far less, there's far less money coming in to somehow bribe our proletariat here in Europe and in North America. So um, the contradictions between our um, bourgeoisie uh, and, and, and our working class, our proletariat will become deeper again. Um, 
there is a lot happening, but um, there are two things. Um, every time that the bourgeoisie feels that they are really in an existential danger, their um, default method is fascism. And fascism is being installed in a very high tempo now, both in um, North America and here in Europe, in many countries. And there's the other thing that, um, unfortunately, even after a year of genocide, there is still this other much bigger danger um, of the complete climate distortion. So um, a, a good comrade, um, may, may God uh, have mercy on his soul, um, an old communist from France told me in the beginning of this century that um, in the time of Luxembourg, it was indeed socialism ou barbarie, the socialism or barbarism. In our century, it is um, some or drowning, socialism or massive flooding. And, and um, th there is an urgency um, in building a revolutionary movement, building a revolutionary momentum that the revolutionaries like Lenin and Luxembourg and Marx really didn't know about because they didn't know that this ecological catastrophe was even possible. Um, so fascism and the material world that might be turning against us quite quickly um, are two huge dangers. But if we manage to organize as many people as possible, if we manage to um, help the struggle in the global south, in the, the, the semi-colonies, but also here, I think we can. It, it, it is possible that we will go to a, a new system that is more rational, that is more humane, that is a socialist system. Hmm. Yes, yes. You're giving you make uh, me uh, adopt a, a sense of uh, credibility with respect to the socialist revolution. It's 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 sort of an obligation. It's it's inevitable in that sense. Yes, yeah. unless there's you know. A military repression, uh, as in the Spanish Civil War, and perhaps uh, after a uh, successful uh, Trump uh, electoral campaign, if he becomes president, then the right-wing uh, fascist currents will become uh, emboldened. They uh, may uh, pass various uh, laws limiting the uh, liberty of the American public, and uh, their uh, supporters, you know, will be emboldened to attack any uh, protesting uh, manifestations and they will then move on to uh, attack uh, the organizational sort of bases and offices you know of all the uh, various movements that have arisen so we have to be prepared to defend ourselves and to defend you know our achievements so far and uh, any demonstration now has to have you know a serious security a bit, a battalion that protects you know the demonstration so that people feel safe coming to protest Otherwise, the fascists will take advantage of any sort of inroads that they were able to make and cause fear amongst the public so that they will not want to go to a demonstration. And we must be able to maintain our freedom to express ourselves in public, which is what I'm facing as well, because I'm being put on trial January the 5th, you know, for having written, you know, a, a couple of words on a um, Israel Day parade poster, which were, and a free Palestine. Wow. It's incredible, you know, how repressive they can get, you know, just because of the words free Palestine, you know, it drives them crazy. <laughs> They're willing to go completely fascist, you know, just to stop those words from being uttered. It's incredible. I mean, it, it demonstrates that they're very desperate and they're very, you know, weak. And the way they react, you know, they're trying to demonstrate that they are strong, but only because they are weak in the first place. So in order to remove the appearance of weakness, they go to an expression of uh, violent repression in order to prove that they are a permanent feature of history, which they are not. And they are no, they know that they are losing their grips on the land because the Palestinians, you know, have a resilience and steadfastness which they cannot defeat. And they, are ha they have the support of billions now in the world, which will not let them be defeated. So, yes, you've turned me into an optimist now. <laughs> um, there was a, a very wise uh, person um, 
who who once quoted the Bible saying that all the imperialists are giants on clay feet, which was actually an image from the book of Daniel. And yeah. Lenin knew that very well when he was using that uh, quote. Yeah. Um, Mao, who didn't knew the, the, the Bible that well, um, he called them paper tigers, which is an expression that is very well known in Chinese culture. Hmm. Um, they look far more dangerous than in reality they are. And I mm. think that um, if you look purely military at the situation um, in Gaza, um, you see that the, 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 the imperialist death force, the IDF, are far from as strong as they have been telling us for all these decades. I mean, hmm. they're um, they're losing tanks, they're losing um, uh, um, bulldozers, they're losing soldiers every day um, in Gaza. It's now happening in Lebanon, and I, I really don't know why um, Netanyahu has decided that he will also try to provoke uh, more aggression with Iran, because they are, militarily, they are losing the war. Um, mm -hmm. This is what their generals are saying. This is there is a big problem starting uh, in September, but it, it's getting worse and worse. The, um, uh, the troops who went on so the um, most soldiers they have to fight uh, active duty for one month and a half, and then they have some holiday. Then they have to go back. They're not coming back anymore. Um, there are like uh, uh, there was like um, a whole platoon of. Um, I don't know, 20, 30 people, um, only six came back. Um, the rest had all, all kinds of reasons not to go uh, and fight. I mean, every reason not to go and fight is a good reason, uh, mm. as I'm concerned. But um, the, 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 the commander of the battalion said that they had to go into Gaza anyway, because that was the order, but they couldn't fight. So they had to, uh, their next term of duty, they had to be in Gaza, do nothing and wait until their term of duty was finished. But how many months will they be able to do this? I mean, even the completely brain, even the most brainwashed sections of the, the, the Zionist society are not crazy. They, they, they have functioning brains. And at some point they will realize this is madness. This is, this is foolishness. Mm -hmm. um, in interviews with uh, uh, soldiers or family of soldiers who refuse to go back, they say that yes, but we we've we've been uh, into Jabalia for like six seven times, uh, clean it completely, and then we go back one month later, and every house is booby trapped again. And so, um, they are giants on clay feet. They are paper tigers. They want us to believe that um, uh, that the IDF was not only the most moral army, but it was the most technologically sophisticated army and, and with men who really fought with uh, uh, with braver and this isn't this is not true that was a lie um mm -hmm. and i think many of us we, we 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 did allow um the zionists to scare us because we actually did believe that mm -hmm. and they are able to murder thousands as long as they're high above in the sky, in their planes, or if they're behind the desk uh, uh, um, controlling a drone. But as soon as they have to have boots on the ground, you see that they're losing. Mm -hmm. And so the only thing that they can do now is continue the genocide. But how? how what will they do? Kill until uh, the, the two million Gazans are, are, are dead? And um, every every day that they continue this they're losing credit um first of all with the international community the real people but even with the international governments um, even here in europe there are more and more governments that are critical and mm. at some point even the american um empire the heartland of the empire they will realize that um, the zionist state has become a liability and no longer an asset i mean um, Saudi Arabia is a far more reliable um, partner uh, to, to dominate the region. Um, at some point, I think, um, within the year from now, um, if this doesn't stop, America will try to push very hard to get Netanyahu away because Netanyahu will be the scapegoat. He will be the cause of everything. And I, I think he will be the cause that uh, in the 1880s, they started with the first migration wave. So, but even that won't work. And I think that at some point, um, the United States will try to make some kind of a, a, a new form of a semi-colony, which will no longer be Zionist, which will no longer use um, the, 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 
this foolish pseudo Jewish ethno nationalist um, ideology. I, I've said it a few times, but I really do believe that Zionism um, in 10 years time, the kids at school will learn about what Zionism was and they will no longer be able to see it in reality because it will be finished mm -hmm. yes I've noticed that uh, the Palestinian resistance in Gaza is not waiting for the uh, occupation military you know to come into view they are out there seeking them and hunting them down now the uh, imperial death force is being hunted they are the ones who are in retreat and there are as many soldiers mm -hmm. who refuse to go and fight in gaza and uh, there's many brigades that have been withdrawn from gaza because they're needed in lebanon they don't have enough troops now they're desperate and they're trying to get the hasidim orthodox jewish population to enroll in the military and to supply them with an additional forty thousand troops they're not going to get it you know, only like 250 have actually, you know, registered, you know, to be soldiers amongst the Haredim, the Orthodox, and 250. You they know, they're to... expecting 40,000, 40, <laughs> really, you know, so they're defeated they right then and there. Um, the, the IDF doesn't want Haredim in their ranks because they will, they will refuse to fight, they will sabotage. <laughs> I mean, um, yeah. even if they... If through force they are able to get like thousands of Haredim, that's one of the worst things that they could do. Yeah. Um, the only thing that they can try to do is make more propaganda on the other side of the Atlantic and hoping that there are more um, right-wing oh. uh, American fundamentalists, either mm. Christian fundamentalists or pseudo-Jewish Christian fundamentalists, um, and hoping that but even they... They were very happy to go there to 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 conquer and to dominate and 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 to steal other people's home. But as soon as there is a risk that they will die, and as soon as there is a risk that they will be hurt, they go back to the United States also. Mm -hmm. So what, what will happen? Will, will, will Smotrich and 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 Gallant and and, and Netanyahu um, go into Lebanon and fight themselves? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. Wow. Yes, I hadn't considered the the resource that uh, the Zionists have. You know, they could dip into uh, getting mercenaries from the evangelical Christian Americans. That could mm -hmm. be a development. You know, if they don't have enough soldiers, you know, to do the seven front war that they're engaged in now, they could actually turn this into, uh, you know, a big regional war. But, but the United States is, you know, restraining their mad dog of uh, Zionism in a uh, in, uh, possible attack on Iran because they don't want to provoke Iran. So they're holding them back. Yeah, it, Iran is quite clear. If this becomes a huge regional war, Iran said, then Europe and the United States are out of oil. Then Iran will, bomb, uh. Uh, will start bombing all the big oil-producing facilities in the Persian Gulf. And mm. they really have the capacity to do that. I mean, um, for some reason, when uh, the, the, the Zionist army was not able to win um, from Hamas, they thought, OK, we'll try Hezbollah. Hezbollah is a thousand times stronger and more organized, better armed. Mm. And that now that they're losing against Hezbollah, their solution is, OK, we'll fight Iran. But mm. uh, Iran is a million times stronger than Hezbollah. Mm -hmm. And... Mm -hmm. um, when as soon as they start really attacking Iran, you will see that Iran is backed by Russia, is backed by China, is backed, and and the United States know this. They don't want a war with Iran either. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that th they have always allowed the, the Zionists to keep doing what they did because it was more or less in the interests of the United States, but it no longer is. Mm -hmm. Wow, yes, interesting, you know, because then both uh, straits would be boycotted against the Zionists. Both the strait of, uh, what is it called, Barra, uh, that the, uh, that the, that the uh, Ansar Allah in Yemen, they've closed it down, you know, to Israel traffic. Yes. And then Iran can close down the other strait to any oil uh, exportations. Mm -hmm. 
if they are attacked. Yes. You know, these uh, ex-third world countries are now taking control of the world political economy. Yes. Very interesting development. If we consider them ex-third world countries, that, that's a bit myopic because it means that we look at like, like the last century and a half. But Iran... Persia has always been like um, the regional superpower long before the Greeks, long before the Romans, long, very long before America. I mean, <laughs> and they know their history. They they know they have shown so much restraint. Um, they did not um, react on the provocations of, of the Zionists with uh, uh, massive violence. They, they always try to have a, 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 um, a measured response and because they know that they have time, they have decades, if necessary, they have centuries. Um, they, mm -hmm. I, I mm -hmm. think that if Netanyahu really pushes um, his country to an open war with Iran, that that um, that will only hasten the downfall of the Zionist uh, 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 project. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, I I have a correction to make. Previously, I referred to. Uh the BRICS international development as a as a federation, as a developing federation. But that's uh, incorrect. It's uh, uh, being built as a confederation. That is a an alliance of various uh, states. Now, if it mm -hmm. were to become a federation in the future, as is the case for the world as a whole, that would mean that the populations of each of these countries would be migrating and intermarrying uh, with uh, an interbreeding with uh, the uh, nations and cultures of, of each of the others until there was an intermingling of population. Once that happens, you have each population with its own national identity, which uh, is affiliated with th their own uh, governing apparatus, even though they may be living in another country. Now, when that becomes a significant portion of the population of each of the countries involved, then you would have a federation in which the people uh, are uh, represented by a, uh, a, a, a political body, a body politic, in other words, but it's not a nation state. Then you have a, the demographic transformation of the world's population from being divided and separated into na from nation states and being translated into a Federation of various cultures, each with their its own distinction, each culture, each national cultural, with their own national cultural autonomy. And this is where the Bundes concept of national cultural autonomy comes in, because national minorities have their representation in each of the countries in which they live as well. Now, one example of what this would result in is in the case of, of the Kurds. Now, the Kurdish uh, people the Kurdish population, the Kurdish culture, is found in a number of different countries. It's found in Iraq, Syria, Turkey, Iran. That's four. Four countries in which the Kurds are to be found in. But they don't have a nation state. And they don't need a, a nation state. And, and, you know, and splitting up all of these countries. Which is why, you know, uh, Turkey, Turkey is freaking out, you know, and sending military force, you know, to destroy the... Uh, the Kurdish uh, forces, which have unfortunately sought an alliance with uh, the Zionist state and with the United States. But with national cultural autonomy, each Kurdish uh, population in each of the countries would have their own national uh, minority representation, which would federate or confederate into a alliance of uh, of the Kurds themselves, so that they would have, you know, a Kurdish entity which could, could claim representation in the United Nations, even though they don't have a nation state. So that's how the United Nations, I think, can be transformed, if there was a transformation, you know, to begin with, with within each national culture, whether it exists in a nation state or not. So these are all developments I can see forthcoming. Uh, but, you know, such developments, you know, in the demographics, you know, would take a long time to develop. You know, I'm talking about 100 years from now in which we would have a world federation. But otherwise, you know, we're burdened, you know, with the nation state still. Ugh. 
Now, I, I what we are facing... We also have to... Uh, oh, yes, I wanted to uh, develop a second topic for our discussion today, and that is the American election. Sure. Yeah. What do you think? Mm -hmm. What do you expect? Uh... I, my, I, I think that one of the two wings of the Imperial Party will win. <laughs> I'm not really sure which one. Yeah. I know that all the other parties don't have a chance. Um, yeah. I uh, I find it quite ironic that the, uh, the Democrat wing is now getting filled up with a lot of Republicans. And um, they're yeah. happy. Look at how many Republicans we've gathered in the last few months. And... Um, if it wasn't so serious, I, I would be um, sick laughing because it, it, it's really, Marx said that history repeats first time as a tragedy, second time as a comedy. Well, um, we, 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 we're in the caricature of the comedy phase now. And um, Yeah, the, the, I mean, like uh, uh, Trump uh, is a comedian, you know, like if, if he were just, you know, doing, you know, like, uh, like uh, you know, shows <laughs> as a comedian, you know. He, he, it's like that's about where he belongs you know he doesn't merit you know plus the more the credit uh, the uh, more of credibility than that you know as a comedian you, you know quite right and you know i like the term comedian there but the whole the whole election campaign um and not just trump's but um i mean it, it's a com it's a comedy soap with with, with 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 characters that have nothing to do with politics anymore you have like the the the, the, the very um right wing uncle uh, uh uh trump and then there's biden who is actually the ever every week they let him say something which is then completely said yes but he's old and he's uh, um it, they they don't speak about real politics um, mm. They don't speak about Gaza or, or, or anything that is happening in Palestine. Actually, mm. um, over the last year, I, I, um, I, I confess, sometimes I love watching American late night comedy shows because it, it, it's a nice way of looking at um, the news that the American friends are getting. Um, I think Jon Stewart... Um, once said something about uh, um, the whole situation in Gaza, and that that's it. Because, um, and I think that it is because uh, he's a he's a, as far as I know, a very critical to Zionism or even anti-Zionist Jewish person, and um, that's why I think he had, and he's very famous, and that's why he could take. Um, some way to say something that sounded a little, little bit critical, but that was really all that I heard about Gaza. Not even the, the Zionist propaganda; they just remained silent about it. Um, they, uh, it, it, it's, and this is all happening while, as I said, the United States are slowly sinking into irrelevance. Yes. Uh, I like the uh, in, in, metaphor that you used of. Uh, I like the metaphor you used, you know, to describe the United States and the two, uh, the two diop, di diopolies there, the two uh, bourgeois parties, forming the wings of an eagle, but one wing does not care what the other wing is doing, and the fact that they're flapping in contrary directions, you know, so the eagle is uh, disabled and is falling. Yes. Yeah, but uh, um, while all this happening, a new generation is slowly discovering the absurdity of it all. Is 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 discovering that um, the whole Democrat idea that vote blue no matter who or that, that this is foolishness. Um, this is the generation that is unionizing Starbucks. That is unionizing um, Amazon. This is a generation that is reading. Lenin and Kropotkin together. So, I, um, huh. yeah, yeah, true. And I, I've seen a few times in the last few years um, in meetings that um, one of these young people was explaining what they were doing, and then one of us old people were saying, "Yes, but Lenin this and that. and really these. Uh, 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 th there is a, a new generation of revolutionaries who really don't care about which ism that you are following or they care about your praxis and they care about the, the impact of what you do. And th yeah. this is something uh, something I have been waiting for for almost 50 years now. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that there is also, this new generation is also taking Dr. Jill Stein and the Green Party's candidacy for the presidency more more credibly. You know, there's a certain credibility that has developed. I can see uh, uh, Dr. Stein, you know, speaking now much more confidently, much mm -hmm. more extensively as well. There's a complete program that the Green Party has adopted. You know, it is a political party uh, of a full stature now, both mm -hmm. in terms of political program and in terms of the states, the number of states in which it has become registered, you know, to be to be uh, listed on the ballot. So there could be a nice surprise there, you know, because if, you know, like I would say that if the Green Party, Jill Stein and, and uh, any other candidate as well, like Dr. <laughs> Cornell West and uh, the uh, Socialist Liberty Party, if they can, you know, amass, you know, amongst themselves, you know, 5% of the vo vote, then that means that neither of the two major bourgeois parties would have a majority you know, credibility, you know, to uphold and to use as a, you know, as a weapon, you know, to impose its will. So then neither of the uh, bourgeois parties would be able to claim that they are representing the entirety of the American public, which is what liberal democracy wants to be able to establish in order to maintain its stability and credibility. It is losing its credibility, even as a government, as a presidency. Mm. Okay. Interesting development. Yes, that's not happened before in U.S. politics. I mean, there was, you know, Ralph Nader, who had a certain impact. Mm. But not like this. You know, Ralph Nader only got 2% of the vote, I believe. Yes. And now, and... we're eyeing 5%. And at that time, that was just people voting for him. There, there wasn't a movement um, ready. There wasn't... Um, there were people who didn't want to vote for um, either Republican or Democrat. Mm -hmm. While now, um, for a whole year, um, in all major cities uh, of the United States, every week, there were hundreds, if not thousands of people in the streets uh, calling, there is uh, only one solution, Intifada revolution. This is a movement, and this is happening. And um, there were some attempts a few months ago by the so-called squad, like the the, the, the the left wing of, of the Democrats, uh, uh, um, uh, and then Bernie Sanders, of course, but they mm. were not able to recuperate this. I mean, um, young revolutionaries, young leftist people in the United States today, they no longer believe Bernie Sanders. I mean, yeah. his time is, well, of, of course, he's also quite old. So the, mm. the, 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 there's a whole generation that is gone uh, or, or that is going away now. But mm. um, people start seeing that he had a very leftist rhetoric, but um, his goal was to get leftist people back into the party. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. Um, and he's more concerned about, you know, getting concessions, you know, for the American worker. And uh, he couldn't care less about the rest of the world, basically. He's yeah. very limited, you know, very social democratic, you know, mentality that he has. And uh, he's also affected, you know, uh, afflicted with the Democratic Socialists of America, DSA, which is just, you know, like a socialist who supports the Democratic Party. And uh, there is, you know, a split in the DSA, though. Some want to quit supporting the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. So we'll see what happens, you know, because if there's a... Uh, a strong vote of 5%, you know, for the alternative candidates, then the left wing of the DSA will become more credible and they will be able to change uh, the DSA from being the lapdog of imperialism to becoming something, you know, that is uh, affiliated with the United Front that's being set up. There could be a United Front, Green Party, DSA, Cornell West, and all the revolutionary parties, plus certain unions. Which union could break the hold of the Democratic Party on the working class in America. Which union will be the first to break from the Democratic Party and lead this United Front coalition into forming a socialist party and perhaps a revolutionary socialist party? United auto workers, steel workers, auto workers, the communists, you no know, electrical workers. I wonder. Because the Communist Party is supporting the Democratic Party as well, you know they're they're worse than Dem Democratic Socialists of America. But there's got to be a break from that, you know. I'm just wondering which union is going to lead that break. That's uh, something to look forward to, I think. I think we have.
have to look at the new um, unions in the, the, the so-called new economic sectors like Amazon, Starbucks, the so-called platform economy. Uh -huh. um, they have to reinvent uh, the union because they uh -huh. work in, in, in different structures, different systems than before. Uh -huh. And um, they really have to, uh, they have to fight a very strong class struggle to be able to just unionize. They are really met with a lot of uh, um, backlash, with a lot of uh, repression uh, in the companies. I think that um, these people, they also do it not from a very social democrat, but from a, a genuine socialist um, background. Mm. I think that this movement to unionize these new sectors, that this can be one of the... the, the um, nuclei uh, of the revolution one of the foci of the revolution as um what was his name uh, 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 called it the the the, the fokismo uh, idea oh you yeah, have yeah, different yeah, yeah. Foci, you have different um I, I i don't for a very long time in my life i had the idea that um the revolution will be led by one uh, centralized party uh, democratic uh, 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 um centralism and so on I don't think that's possible, and I, I don't even think that it's necessary. There mm -hmm. is a, a very diverse movement. This diversity is our strength. It, 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 mm. it, um, if I organize in a very Leninist way and you organize in a very anarchist way, and um, it becomes harder for the bourgeoisie and their, uh, um, and their police to, to really repress us. Mm -hmm. That's why we're in a convergence now, because we're bringing yes. together all of these various facets you know, of the revolutionary socialist struggle. And defining revolutionary socialism as our common ideal, not a leader, not a structure, not a nation state. No, it's the actual revolutionary process itself, which is taking the lead. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Very good. So uh, we can conclude on an optimistic note there, which is the best note to conclude with. And uh, as we compose the revolution here, as if it were a musical symphony of various you know, instruments that combine together to form something which is beyond what each one you know, can achieve. Basically, we are a symphony of political uh, autonomous institutions that seek to achieve the harmony of revolution. How about mm -hmm. that? Okay. That's um, maybe uh, as we are ending on a positive note, I, I hope, inshallah, in the next few weeks to finish the book that I'm writing uh, on a political theology of hope and optimism, because I saw too many of my comrades getting depressed over the last half year. Mm -hmm. There is this beautiful story in the Talmud about Rabbi Akiva, um, who was um, a, a very famous uh, sage in the Talmud. He was from yes. a working class background. Ah. He was one of the huge supporters of the Bar Kokhba anti-colonial revolt. Uh -huh. um, and at some point in his life, um, before the Bar Kokhba revolt, um, he went to the temple, which had been destroyed. His comrades were all crying and they were all very sad. But he saw two foxes playing there and he started laughing because he said this was predicted. This is what the prophets told us. And if this is true, then the next part is also true. Uh -huh. And I think that we have to, there are so many elements of things that we have been predicting. We have been predicting them. Marx has been predicting them. And we, we knew that these things were going to happen because they are, they are in the nature of, of, of the dynamics that are going on in history. And we are now seeing them. And... On one side, it hurts to see the, the, the mass murders being committed by imperialism. But if you learn to look at it with what I call the prophetic uh, eye, with seeing mm. the, the, the dynamics as they are going on and where they're, they're, they're going to, which direction they're going, it should make us hopeful. Because mm. I really believe that this system that we're living in, is it, it it's in its last days, its last years. And that's why it's becoming more violent. Um, uh, and that's why probably the next years will be brutal and will be, um, I'm not that optimistic for the very near future, hmm. but I think that 
I may may survive long enough to see the end of all of this and to really see the beginning of something new. Mm. I hope that the book will be ready in a few weeks, inshallah. Very good. Um, yes, uh, the more violent that the imperial regimes become, the more they destroy themselves because they're destroying yes. their own credibility. You know, because if if they cannot maintain a stable and peaceful world, then what use are they? Mm. Yeah. And um, they may build very, very strong armies, but most revolutions started as soon as the soldiers turned their guns mm -hmm. yes. and shot the generals on their own sides. Um, there's a whole couplet of the Internationale that's about this idea. Mm -hmm. and this, this is what happened in the Russian Revolution. The soldiers mm -hmm. um, were a huge part of the revolutionaries. As soon as they realized that um, they were killing and being killed, not for their own interest, but for the interest of, of a ruling class that exploited them, um, they became a huge force for the revolution. You know, I read a, a, a certain reference to that phenomena and when I was reading about the history of the Jewish Bund in, uh, in the revolutionary processes, 1905-1917. And it, did, it made mention of the fact that there were Jewish Bundist women who went onto the Potemkin uh, 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 military destroyer to agitate amongst the sailors so that they would revolt against the Tsarist regime. <laughs> and they did. <laughs> you mm. know, this is one way in which the uh, battleship Potemkin revolted and started the revolution of 1917. Yeah, because of women. And also there was the Women's Day March, you know, which was the first revolutionary march at the time. Plus... The march led by that Father Grappon, who was a police agent, who was trying to save the Tsarist regime by obliging it to institute various reforms, which they refused, and thus he provoked the revolution himself. <laughs> it's interesting how are... these revolutions can start. They can start just with even one person, like in Tunisia, who put himself on fire because he was insulted by a cop. <laughs> there are huge the discussions among the biographers of uh, um, Pope Gabon, because some really believe that he was quite honest and that he really did it uh, um, for the workers in a very naive way. He wasn't an, an organized socialist. Hmm. Um, it is clear that in later years, there were very shady contacts with, uh, with, with police forces, but it's never hmm. been proven there were these contacts before 1905. So, and of course, um, the, the 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 Bolshevik party didn't really want him to get much credit because he was he was not just ah, yes. uh, not a con he was a priest he was an orthodox priest so yeah 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 um, okay so, so uh, you know that could be a very yeah you know, uh, that's slanderous to say that uh, he was a police agent yes uh -huh. interesting mm -hmm. yeah very good okay we will continue next week again and. Uh, we can look forward to some uh, revolutionary prospects developing in the course of this coming week. Every week now is, you know, like crucial. We are in a very crucial time and our work is very crucial as well. And what we have to say is uh, a key to unlocking the process that is underway. Now, the development of this process, we're not sure. We don't know where it's going to go but we know how to open it. And that's what we're doing here with our with our voices. And thanking all the viewers you know, for your attention. And please share this video so that this discussion can be uh, propagated further and developed further by other people as well. Thank you very much for your attention. We are the Convergence Forum of the International Intercommunalist Convergence. Thanking you again for your attention. Bye for now. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.